Hello, you are listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. I'm your host, Raphael Ketchturi. Joining us today is Joan Wallach Scott, Professor Emerita in the School for Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Scott is the author of many groundbreaking works in the fields of gender history and modern France, including Gender and the Politics of History, Only Paradoxes to Offer, French Feminist and the Rights of Man, Parité, Sexual Equality and the Crisis of French Universalism, The Politics of the Veil, The Fantasy of Feminist History, and Sex and Secularism. One of her most recent books, published in 2018, is Knowledge, Power, and Academic Freedom, which will be the topic of our conversation today. Professor Scott, thank you for joining us. Thank you for for inviting me. So I'd like to begin with um, talking a little bit about what you understand academic freedom to be. Uh, This is a term that has obviously been used in a variety of senses, but who does it usually cover and in what kinds of contexts and situations does it apply? Well, I would I, I tend to, to have a, a fairly um, narrow definition of academic freedom. I think it applies overall to faculty at universities. I think it's not an individual right so much as a corporate right. That is, it pertains to the teaching um, research functions of faculty at universities, whether they are tenured or not. Although tenure has become is a protection of academic freedom, I think adjuncts as well as full professors on tenure, <laughs> full tenured professors are, are ought to be protected by um, academic freedom. And what it is, is the notion that um, the certification by your discipline of your ability as a historian or a physicist or a, a mathematician um, gives you a certain power in the classroom to define um, what it is that you're teaching, to define your syllabus, um, to uh, determine by what standards students' work is judged or not. Um, and it's, it's the, the, the notion that that teaching and that classroom space is inviolable, that you are, as the faculty member, responsible for it, and no one can tell you what to do or how to teach in that situation. Um, it pertains also to the research that faculty do um, and to what's referred to as their extramural speech. Um, that is their right as a citizen to um, engage in any kind of speech that citizens would, would engage in. That is, it's a First Amendment right of free speech, but that free speech cannot be held against a faculty member if it seems to violate some notion of um, politics or decorum um, in the eyes of of the university administration. So it's teaching, research, and extramural speech that are governed by the notion of academic freedom. And the principle of academic freedom obviously has a long history, but when do you think that that principle in in the modern sense first took shape? And um, what were its purposes at the time and have those purposes changed in, in yeah. recently? So it has a long history going back to Europe, European origins and the notion of the autonomy of the university and its faculty, but it becomes relevant in the United States in the progressive era, at the beginning really of, of the, the 20th century, the end of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and it, it's, I would, there's lots of writing about academic freedom in the early 1900s, but I would say the notion is codified for the United States in 1915 by the founding of the American Association of University Professors. Um, Among the founders are John Dewey, the the educational philosopher John Dewey, who had been writing about academic freedom for a number of years before that. And it's, it's, the point is to protect uh, the integrity of faculty teaching at what are becoming major research universities um, against things that are are familiar to us now. That is the power of trustees to determine what gets taught and what not. In the early 1900s, there are firings of a number of university professors, most of them economists, who are thought by university administrators and boards of trustees to be socialists or supporting the wrong um, side of whatever economic policies uh, the trustees 
want them want them to be on. So in response to those firings, very dramatic firings, the AAUP is founded, and the notion that academic freedom is what is being defended by that organization is tremendously important. And it's important to note that the AAUP doesn't consider itself a union. It considers itself to be more a kind of a corporate body representing um, its faculty and, and the integrity and um, rights of, of its faculty. How things have changed today, I mean, I think some of, some of the research I've done on the history of academic freedom, I think, wow, there were people in the early 1900s, members of the board of trustees saying, you know, if these professors aren't teaching what I think they should be teaching, I'm taking my money away from this university. So, plus ça change, as they say in French, you know, the more things change, the more they seem to remain the same. But I think to the extent that universities are dependent on political uh, legislatures in the state, the case of state universities, private donors in the case of private universities, to the extent that funding, however large or small, comes from these external sources, uh, the university is always susceptible to violations of academic freedom. So I would say things feel a little more intense right now. The protections of tenure, which didn't exist in 1915 either, I mean, tenure is a relatively new development, um, but the protections of tenure now uh, protect fewer and fewer um, academics. In the, in the 1970s, something like 25% of university and college faculty were not on tenure tracks or tenured. Now it's the reverse. Now something like 75% of university teachers, university and college teachers, are not on tenure tracks, are contract employees, contingent employees. So we're in a very different situation about um, who has the power to enforce and demand the rights of academic freedom. That has changed, I think, dramatically. But the pressures of, <laughs> of money and power seem to me to remain the same. And I want to come back to that question of, of tenure and academic freedom um, a little later into our conversation. Uh, but I'd also want to, you know, talk a little bit about what you've noted in your research is that there's gradually what we've seen is a conflation between this corporate principle of academic freedom that you're talking about and claims to the exercise of the First Amendment as the right for free speech. So this is something that you've noted has been happening on the American right um, in more recent decades is that it's gradually focused on the First Amendment issues in higher education. Um, when do you think that process began and why is it that its, um, its advocates have been relatively successful in, in advancing their cause through this, this um, blurring of the distinction between these, these things? Well, first, just the blurring of the distinction, I think, is an important one because uh, the First Amendment applies to individual rights of free speech. Academic freedom applies to corporate rights of faculty, to a certain extent of students who have a right to learn under the notion. I didn't mention that earlier, but students' right to learn is, part, is considered to be part of their academic freedom. But the right to learn is not the right to have any opinion recognized as a valid one. Um, in, in the classroom. But I don't know, I don't know exactly when this started. I would say that it, it's a, an offshoot of the Reagan revolution. <laughs> and it, it has to do with an increasing emphasis since the Reagan administration in court decisions and other ways on the rights of individuals um, the, the, and, and on um, individuals as the bearers of rights and a de-emphasis on class action suits on corporate rights of, of one kind or another. And I think in, in the most recent years and, and certainly before the Trump administration came into power, there has been an increasing attempt on the right to use an appeal to free speech to counter what is thought to be the uh, left or liberal emphasis in university classrooms. I mean, I think that's an exaggeration. I don't really think that um, universities are agents of propaganda. I do think they are um, institutions devoted or ought to be institutions devoted to critical thinking 
And I think that for um, those on the right, critical thinking is a danger to the protection of the power they want to, to hold. So there's some validity in that. It's just not a matter of, of indoctrination versus um, uh, free speech or free thought. It's a matter of, of um, what counts as critical thinking and critical um, knowledge that is produced in, in the university. So um, it's, I, and I think, so I think I, I couldn't put a, a date on it, but I do think it's an offshoot of what we might call the Reagan, um, the Reagan revolution. And it's come to its uh, <laughs> incarnation in the Trump administration, which um, confuses the notion of academic freedom and individual uh, rights or rights of free speech and in the various attempts by right-wing groups to sponsor speakers on campus, deliberately outrageous speakers like Milo Yiannopoulos or Ann Coulter, who have no business on university campuses, it seems to me, except as, as entertainment of a certain kind. Um, but the point is, or the point was, not only to introduce those people onto campus, but to provoke um, student opposition to provoke the left, whatever that is, um, into uh, actions that would then be taken to be violations of the rights of free speech, protest movements of one kind or another, um, demonstrations, attempts to silence the speakers, demands that the speakers not be invited to talk at commencement, for example. So um, exactly, so I, I, I think the Reagan administration, the, the tendency to an emphasis on uh, individual rights um, has been building slowly over the years and has now found its, well, found its, its fulfillment first under the Obama administration, not because of Obama, but in opposition to Obama. I think that the beginnings of a clear attempt by right-wing organizations of one kind, foundations, the Koch Foundation, the Amway Foundation, the Goldwater Foundation, we could list them all. Um, the attempt by them to shut down the university as a place of critical thinking has built slowly over the years. And um, under the Obama administration, which seemed to be a progressive liberal moment in, in our history, the emphasis on undermining the critical role of universities, the critical production of knowledge became more intense. And now it's finding its fruition in, in Trump, who in various executive orders have um, supported these right-wing attempts to shut down, what I would argue is to shut down critical thinking at universities, not to deny free speech. I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk uh, about how some of your your research on this um, illuminates the question of power differentials in, in universities. So universities as sites where significant power dynamics come into play. Mm -hmm. um, so how do asymmetries of power on campus figure into this this topic of free speech and academic freedom? I was thinking particularly when it comes to balancing between First Amendment rights the kind of corporate notion of academic freedom that you are talking about, and then some of the protections that are afforded individuals under Title IX? That's a huge question. <laughs> I mean, I think that that has, um, it, it's a really interesting one. It would probably take us longer than we have to, to fully go into it, but I'll try. So in it, first of all, the, the asymmetries of power come from, um, the relationship between administrators, faculty, and students. And in what we might now think of as the corporate university, students are often defined as customers uh, by administrators who uh, want their, uh, their clients to be satisfied. The customer is always right. Um, the, the other, so that's one piece. The other, another piece is that in the emergence of the corporate university, um, questions of um, risk, insurance risk, liability for lawsuits, um, the, the protection of the brand of the university have come to be more important than they used to be, whenever that used to be was. Uh, and that means that um, 
administrators will often make decisions not based on attention to the principles of academic freedom or of the governing of a university, but to considerations about what will best protect them from lawsuits or negative publicity. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the, and the third thing is that the power of faculty in what was called the shared governance of the university has also been undermined. Faculty senates have less power than they used to at many institutions. Uh, universities uh, less and less consult with faculty bodies of one kind or another to determine um, everything from um, how to cut budgets to what sort of curriculum um, should be uh, uh, advanced or, or supported. So you're in a situation in which the power of faculty has been undermined on the one hand by um, administrative attention to questions like uh, legal uh, responsibility and branding and the other by students who are in an increasingly powerful position to claim that their rights have been violated in, in one form or another. So you get a situation in which a student complaint leads to faculty firing with no <laughs> recourse by the faculty to the uh, ordinary procedures by which a tenured faculty member, for example, is considered or not for uh, uh, suspension or, or firing. Mm -hmm. um, you have a situation in which um, student complaints, sometimes justifiable, sometimes not, are not investigated but simply immediately reacted to. You have a situation in which a tweet by a faculty member uh, incurs outrage on the part of some trustees and the university responds by suspending or firing the faculty member. So the, the um, questions of academic freedom don't even come up. It's the question of, of uh, what do we do to uh, end the negative publicity that we are getting um, on the basis of these particular actions by um, students or, or by faculty. I mean, some of the, some of the student protests seem to me to be justified, um, but others of them, for example, <laughs> there was the example at, I think it's at USC in the, in the business school a couple of weeks ago where a faculty member in a class used a Chinese word that sounded like the N-word in English. And the students, a couple of students said that they felt um, that he was somehow insulting them, although he was badly speaking Chinese, but he was speaking in Chinese. And it was about China that he was talking. He was suspended and is now, um, may or may not be fired. I don't think we know the outcome of that. But the faculty there interviewed say, and it's a conservative business school, the faculty there say, we're afraid to say anything in class now. We don't know what to do. We don't, we don't know what our rights are anymore. Uh, so the chilling effect on um, free speech and on academic freedom, that is the right to talk in a classroom about the material that you're supposed to teach and present, is, uh, is called into question in, in, that, in that kind of situation. And that's one example of, of many, I think. There are good examples of universities who say, uh-uh, um, we are going to look into this question before we take any action. But those are in the minority. Those university administrators are the, I would say the heroes of the day, but they are, um, they are in the definite minority. The, the majority of cases are ones in which administration acts way too quickly and um, allows the students to have more power than they should have. There's nothing wrong with students raising questions and protesting, but the response, and, and it's not up to them, the students, to decide whether or not what someone has done is valid. It's up to the processes by which investigations and determinations of uh, fit or unfit behavior are made that need to be uh, called into question and the administration that responds instantly by um, firing or, or suspending somebody is they are the ones who are um, not fulfilling their responsibility to teach the students what the limits and possibilities of academic freedom are.
the question of Title IX is a whole other story. Um, we did a big, I was one of the people who did this big AAUP report a couple, two years ago now, I think, called the, um, I can't remember now, the, it, it, it's not the pluses and minuses, but the benefits and, and limits or the problems and, and, and positive aspects of, of Title IX. And again, it had to do with the way administrators were responding to charges of sexual harassment. Um, sexual, that sexual harassment is a problem. <laughs> There's no question about that. Um, but uh, again, the response to a charge of sexual harassment that involved no uh, procedures for faculty to defend or for students to defend themselves. I mean, it was the one moment when in the revised uh, Title IX um, stuff that Betsy DeVos developed, the one thing I think we agreed with at AAUP was that there ought to be investigative procedures set up which protected the rights of the accused as well as um, the, the rights of victims. Not to the extent that the accused would be <laughs> free of um, responsibility, but that uh, accusations of the kind made under Title IX are grave accusations, and they need to be investigated, not assumed to be the truth, um, even though in many cases they are, <laughs> you know, that, uh, but the procedures uh, required a kind of attention to due process that was not being um, followed in the quick rush to judgment that administrators were making um, in these Title IX cases. I want to stay on this topic of, of protest and the corporatized university. Um, so one thing that we can maybe also raise is uh, you've noted that most universities do not see dissent uh, and protest as issues of free speech that should be protected along the, the same lines as, um, let's say, students just wanting to be able to say whatever is on their right. So um, how do universities currently draw the the difference between the two, and um, what what are the broader implications of that? Well, one of the one of the disturbing things I think was to watch the free speech stuff, <laughs> the free speech accusations be leveled against student protesters and dissenters, and to watch the right uh, and conservatives become victims of violations of free speech in many of these protest movements. Um, I think I say somewhere that, um, that if, you, if you looked at um, New York Times articles um, between 2016 and 2018, the Times published, and this is a quoting from, from Henry Reichman's book on, um, which is called The Future of Academic Freedom, which is a, a terrific book to, to, um, to, to, to use as almost a kind of handbook of the history of, of academic freedom. So he shows that between, um, May 2016 and January 2018, the New York Times published 21 columns or articles decrying the alleged silencing of conservatives on campus, the so-called, now they're calling it the, 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 what is it, the cancel culture. While only three pieces in the same period talked about the silencing of those on the other side, um, those on the, on the left, whether they were Palestinian students or uh, left students protesting um, um, the, the protesting the conditions of, of racism on campus, any of that kind of stuff. And for me, the, the sort of the, the model of the contradictions of all of this is in the so-called University of Chicago's model report on um, freedom of expression. Um, and that report is is uh, tricky and deceptive, I think, in its endorsement of. Um, the notions of freedom of expression, because what it leaves out is protest. Um, it talks about discussion, endless notions of, it, the use of the word discussion is <laughs> over and over and over, discussion, free speech, we can discuss. But they say discussion is welcome as long as it does not disrupt the ordinary activities of the university. And that is left vague. Now, the ordinary activities of the university are teaching and research and blah, blah, going to the library, <laughs> eating lunch in the cafeteria. But the notion that protest um, is a right of, of free speech uh, is just absent from that 
from that document. And I think protest, having myself been a student protester in my years in college and, and, and graduate school, I think protest is part of the rights of students, um, not the protest to uh, shut down a speaker, but the pro completely, not, not the, what is it, the, the heckling veto. Uh, I don't support that, but I do support the notion that you could go into a, um, a, a talk by Yiannopoulos and hold up signs that said, you know, <laughs> whatever, you, you are denouncing his hate speech. Um, or that, you know, students stand up and turn their backs on a speaker. Um, those kinds of, of um, protests seem to me to be a crucial part of a student's education. It, it's how you learn to be a political citizen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they can go overboard, um, as one can cite all kinds of, of cases, but you know, I even think the sit-ins I participated in during the protests against the Vietnam War um, and the teach-ins, which were organized around sit-ins, were a part of exercising my rights as a citizen, um, if not as a student. So it, it seems to me that, that protest as a right of free, free speech is a crucial thing that needs to be recognized um, and is not being recognized um, as well as it should be by university administrators who are quick because they're afraid of the, of the protest, to rent rooms to Richard Spencer, the, 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 the Nazi Richard Spencer, uh, on their campuses, but who are as quick to denounce student protesters as um, somehow outside the pale of what is acceptable in, in university behavior. And I want to stay on this topic of, of protest and, and so-called cancel culture today. Um, so w w with a couple of questions, I guess the first one has to do with, you've spoken about how universities have shifted towards this corporatized model that sees students primarily as clients or customers. Uh, when a campus does become embroiled in a free speech controversy, such as Milo Yiannopoulos or Charles Murray or uh, someone else, um, appeals are often made by students to undemocratic university administrations to address the issue by revoking their invitation or, or taking some other measure. Um, are there alternative, perhaps more democratic ways of, of um, keeping campuses on one hand kind of free from abusive behavior, but on the other hand, um, uh, creating situations where a plurality of voices can weigh in rather than just simply, uh, you know, the, the direct appeal to, to the upper echelons of, of the university? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think their faculty and students need to work together on on the alternatives. Um, there was a good example for me a couple of I don't know how many years ago now, but at, at Connecticut College, um, where there was a case of a professor, a philosophy professor, who tweeted, or maybe on Facebook, I I don't remember what the <laughs> what the what the media vehicle was, all sorts of of um, really uh, racist is the only word to use, des descriptions of Palestinians. Um, talked about them as mad dogs and, you know, and the students were, uh, or a group of students were rightfully, I think, upset about this. And their initial impulse was to demand that he be fired, but they worked with faculty in philosophy and political science departments to talk about what an alternative would be <clears throat> to um, the kind of, you know, protest in front of the guy's house and denunciations of his classes and so on. And they came up with a, a proposal that I think the university president accepted to have um, open meetings about um, questions of systemic racism on campus. And these were, they were sort of, in a way, it reminded me of the teach-ins during the Vietnam War. Um, they were the use of academic knowledge to um, analyze a current political situation, a, a, yeah, a political situation. And I think there could be a lot more of that. I think um, faculty and students need to work together on the use of what is their expertise, that is the production of knowledge, to address some of these, of these questions. So um, were I still teaching in the university, 
I would, I would want to be working with the students to talk about what the best strategies were to advance the positions that we want to advance, to criticize the things that we want to criticize, and to find ways of doing it that didn't play into this right-wing uh, monopoly of the conversation right now on what counts as free speech and who has the right to it. Do you think the same um, then applies to the more specific question of the presence of conservative research institutes on campuses? Um, so uh, is it possible to develop effective strategic responses to, to the presence of these, of these um, organizations um, that doesn't either kind of just simply appeal to uh, university administrators for, for a, a general ban or, or perhaps um, mobilize some of the other techniques that people have now critically come to call cancel culture? Yeah, I do think there are ways to do it. I mean, first of all, I think that conservative research institutes are fine. That is, as long as they are not, um, in fact, as long as the funders are not calling the shots about who gets hired and what gets taught, which again is a violation of academic freedom in its most profound way. And that certainly is true of the Koch funding of um, institutes at various universities, especially at George Mason University. And so my example there of the, um, the um, strategic response is the movement that students started, which, was, which has come to be called Uncoke My Campus. And those, those Uncoke My Campus people are, were brilliant. They um, used the Freedom of Information Act to get access to emails and other documents that demonstrated the uh, intrusion of the Koch Foundation representatives on the, on the decision-making of who was gonna be appointed a, a university professor, of who was gonna rename the, the law school, the Scalia um, Law School, and so on and so forth. So uh, and for me, they are the model group for um, addressing this question. That is, it's fine to have a, an institute that is looking into the history of capitalism, <laughs> let's say, in a positive way. Um, I wouldn't want to outlaw those as, just as I wouldn't want to outlaw the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women that I founded in, in, um, at Brown University when I was there. Um, I wouldn't want um, a kind of test of the um, principles or premises of the, the, of the center to be um, under scrutiny. You know, there are people who thought that a feminist center at Brown was, you know, anathema and worried about uh, what its effects would be. So it's not the, the conservative bias or the feminist bias or the liberal bias uh, that, that is the issue. The issue is the extent to which the funders of those institutions intrude on the appointment of faculty and the teaching um, of, of a particular curriculum. And that is what Uncoke My Campus did brilliantly in the case of the Coke money at, at George Mason University. So they, they are the, the, and they were graduate students and undergraduates, you know. Now it's an organization that's, that's a, a nationwide organization because there's Coke money in a lot of universities, not just at, at George Mason. George Mason was the kind of, of a prime example of that intrusion. Uh, but they are, for me, the, the, the model of how to address these things and how to deal with them. Great. So I want to now turn to a couple of questions um, uh, about a topic that we addressed a little bit earlier, which is the question of tenure and the the protection that it affords academics and the way that it operates for um, to to help with academic freedom. Um, you of course have noted that tenure track and tenure jobs are at an all time low, and the vast majority of academics are contingent and subject to much more scrutiny than. Um, than tenured faculty and therefore to easier dismissal um, for speech that's deemed either too controversial, too political, and so forth. So, um, so when I, it seems to me that when we talk about power differentials on campus, it's not simply between those, between teachers and students or students and other students, but it's also within faculty, mm -hmm. the ranks of the faculty themselves. Yep. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, um, and that's a huge problem. Um, 
I think that um, I think that it's a problem that although it's recognized, it's not recognized enough. The AAUP has a drive that's called one faculty, one union, or one faculty, one organization. And the idea is that uh, all of us, tenured or not, uh, need to be thinking about the conditions under which teaching is done at, at various universities. So, but I do think that there's a tremendous uh, differential between the privileged tenured few and the unprivileged, um, untenured contingent many. Um, and that is a problem of political organizing and political thinking that um, hasn't gone far enough. I mean, I don't know quite what else to say. I was really moved, um, let's see if I can find the book. Where is it? Yeah, there was a, I think a brilliant young historian named Aaron Carrico, who has a, a Yale PhD and just published a book on, on the effects of reconstruction on um, the formerly enslaved. It, it, it's, it's about, the book is, is sort of a reading of uh, post uh, reconstruction slavery. Mm -hmm. And what I wanna find here is acknowledgements. And I just wanna read you the acknowledgements because it seems to me to capture just what you say. He starts out, books such as this are usually written under the conditions of tenure, usually guaranteeing a job. This one has been written instead under the conditions of tenuousness that have become the default for laborers in higher education as they have for laborers everywhere. It has been written on a string of yearly contracts without certainty of continued employment. It is a product of precariousness and insecurity. These structural conditions have to be acknowledged first and foremost these conditions help to underwrite the comfort and safety of the tenured, yours perhaps. <laughs> if so, your good luck comes with your greater responsibility. If you are in academia, you are implicated in the present catastrophe. Demonstrate solidarity with adjuncts, warn and prepare your students, educate your colleagues and administrators and make a change. Like the United States, academia is no meritocracy and everyone deserves financial security. And then he goes on to do what you usually do in, a, in an acknowledgement and thank all the people who matter. When I read that, I thought, this, this is the call that has to be made in a much more sustained and um, intense way to the question. Because the situation in COVID has pointed that up dramatically. Mm -hmm. Everyone is in a situation of precarity right now. I, I have a former student who teaches in Florida who said that there is a a billion dollar shortfall in the university system and cuts are going to come like mad. And so tenured faculty are going to be uh, on the grounds of financial exigency are going to be losing their jobs. So it's, it's, we are not talking about a stable market in which there's a privileged few and an, un, uh, an unprivileged many. We're talking about a situation of precarity that is gradually extending itself. Um, beyond the, the the bounds of what usually were thought to be the the differences and separation, so that Aaron Carrico's call to pay attention, it seems to me, is one that um, needs to be followed through on in a in a more systematic way than it has been. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and do you think that um, attempts by by graduate workers to to form organizations like labor unions, so labor union drives among them and non-tenure track faculty mm -hmm. should be considered forms of exercising free speech in yeah. the workplace. Yeah, I do. I do, even though the charge against many of these unions is that <clears throat> they're gonna interfere in academic freedom because they're gonna specify um, not what can be taught, but what the relationship, the, the mentoring relationship ought to be between faculty and students. Mm -hmm. But I think there's no question that the use of graduate students and adjunct is a cost-saving measure on the part of universities that needs to be rectified. And you, you know, there are places where graduate students are on um, are, are food scarce. Graduate students are are in very precarious situations, mm -hmm. and are teaching, uh, carrying teaching loads that are excessive, and that are not very well um, remunerated. So. Yes, I, I think uh, union drives by graduate 
graduate workers and, and non-tenure track faculty are necessary and are an exercise um, not only of free speech, individual rights, but of corporate rights. Well, I want to finish with, with one final question, which takes a step back and tries to look at this in, I guess, more broader um, theoretical or maybe historical terms. But it seemed to me that there's an inherent tension between academic free speech as a corporate right and its pedagogical purpose for a democratic society. So on one hand, the process of academic knowledge production historically has been highly specialized and elitist, um, uh, I, not even just kind of attaching normative um, uh, you know, inflection to that term, but I think that that's just kind of like as a descriptive. And on the other hand, historically, as you pointed to, um, higher education, especially in public universities, beginning with the progressive movement, was framed in broadly Deweyan terms as a necessary element for the self-government of a democratic republic. Um, so is it possible to square the circle between academic knowledge production as a kind of very specialized form of activity and the role that it can have in terms of cultivating and fostering democratic values? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that um, academic knowledge, uh, the, the um, unequal or maybe even undemocratic relationship between students and their teachers is necessary for the production of democracy. Um, without educated citizens, without critically thinking citizens, people whose own um, upbringing ideas have been put to the test uh, without learning how to think critically about what is presented to you as truth, uh, being able to sort out the difference between um, fictional facts and, and, and real ones. Uh, we don't have a citizenry that can produce a democracy. Uh, there, I think I would cite Wendy Brown's book, um, Undoing the Demos, as uh, an example in which she talks about the fact that the undermining of educations, not only higher education, but starting from um, kindergarten on, the undermining of public support for education um, over the past 30 or, or, or some years has made, has given us a stupider population. <laughs> you know, there's, it's no accident that um, Fox News can convince its followers that um, that their alternative facts are real uh, because people haven't been taught to think uh, in, in classrooms. So I think there's something about the, it's not a matter of indoctrination because what, at least the way I understand university teaching and teaching at any level, is, it, it, it's about develop, and, and the Dewey and notion of progressive education is about developing the individual's ability to think reasonably, coherently, critically about what it is they're presented with. And that experience, that form of teaching, Socratic maybe, as opposed to uh, uh, theological or, or indoctrinating, that form of teaching is, is what we've lost um, in the last uh, 30 or, or, or some years, not oh, everywhere, not across the board. But without that, you don't get democracy because democracy depends on a rational, educated public. And if you don't have that, you don't have democracy. So um, it's, I don't even think of education as elitist. I think of it as the teacher kind of inspiring and eliciting from the students forms of reasonable thinking that are crucial for um, any democratic society. Mm -hmm. Professor Scott, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. It's been a pleasure talking to you.